We are just delighted to have you here. As Dr. Spears is going to share, this is the first time we've hosted this lecture and luncheon um, in our history. Things ex looked a little bit different during uh, dental orientation or your first week of dental school. So uh, like with most things in life, COVID has changed the way a lot of things are done and has given us a, a lot of opportunities to reconsider um, events and activities and functions within the school. But we are just delighted to host this luncheon for you today as a part of your welcome week um, and your orientation schedule. So uh, we have a lot of really great guests with us in addition to our new class members. Um, I'll let Dr. Spears kind of give you some insight as to who they are. Um, but at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Spears, our Associate Dean for Student and Academic Affairs. Dr. Spears. Thank you, everybody. So I would say great to see you. I've seen most of you for the last two days. Um, but I want to reemphasize some things that Ms. Pfizer said and that this being the first of these events, this really is a landmark occasion. This is something that we've kind of had in the works and have thought about for a few years now. When you come in for orientation, you know, we used to do the white coat ceremony and it was an introduction to the profession. It was introduction to ethics, professionalism, and all the things that that white coat and the profession expects out of you. Well, to further kind of emphasize that aspect of it, you know, so much of what we've talked about during orientation week might be things that you forget about tomorrow or next week or whatever. We are not expecting that the aspect of ethics and professionalism are things that you will forget. And there's no better person to get up and talk to you about this than Dr. Kenneth Horowitz, who I'll introduce formally in just a minute. Um, he embodies everything that he's going to talk to you about and the things that we expect from you. So before we get started on that, I do want to make a few introductions um, around the room. You see there's several different people here beyond just you and your classmates. So we have some faculty, some alums, and some donors here within the, the room. And so I'm not going to take the moment or take the time to introduce each one because I'd probably take up most of the, the time that we have available to us. But if you are an faculty member, alum, donor, please rise and let's all recognize you for being a part of this. We as an institution cannot do what we do here without the support of particularly our donors. They help make so many of these things possible for us. And I love the fact that we have alumni who will come back here and continue to contribute to the school and keep it strong, keep it going in the right direction and make themselves available to you, give you them, give you their years of experience, their years of expertise and helping you navigate that process through the program. It's a vital part of what we do. There's a lot of faculty here at the school for you to meet over the next four years. You're going to meet a lot of people starting next week. Each week you'll meet some different people. So, I always say, you know, make yourself known to your faculty. The dean mentioned the other day about there's almost nothing worse than getting to graduation, and he makes the comment of, I didn't even recognize that student. I didn't even know who they were. That's not what you want for yourself, all right? Get to know your faculty. Make sure that they're aware of you, your goals, your expectations, what you're trying to accomplish. They'll help you get there. No person is an island. You're working on this as a team, as a group of students, as a class of 2026, getting through this program and getting to that eventual point where you're going to make that decision, what type of dentist you're going to become, where you're going to go, those sort of things. You heard from Dr. Long in the PACE Center yesterday about all the different things they can do for you. There's multiple things here at this school that are set up the same way to help you in that process and get you through this program and help you become that best dentist that you're going to become someone that we will look at and be glad and proud that you're a graduate of the UT School of Dentistry here in Houston. All right? So I'm not going to take up more of your time with an introduction. Instead, I'd like to turn it over to our speaker. So as I mentioned, at the White Coat Ceremony for years, Dr. Horowitz has given, he's been the keynote speaker for this, I guess, every White Coat that we've had. And it's a phenomenal presentation that he does. With moving the white coat ceremony into the second year, we still wanted to get across and impress upon you the importance of the introduction to the profession, of the importance of ethics and professionalism and what you're going to embody every day going forward, 
really starting today, but we'll say starting Monday of next week and going through not just your time here, but representing you know, your school after you graduate from here. All right, so day one, ethics, professionalism, all the things that that embodies. And there's no one better than Dr. Horowitz to talk about that. That's why we've made this special lecture that we were here for today. So let me give you, I would say a brief, there is no brief introduction for Dr. Horowitz. Um, this is a, a legend, if you will, and you're, I'll touch on a few things here. But what you'll see is Dr. Horowitz is a native of Beaumont, Texas, and attended the University of Texas at Austin, where he played varsity basketball. How about that? You know, you didn't really, how many athletes do we have? You know, Dr. Cooley being the big baseball player, Dr. Horowitz, a basketball player. You know, like we got all kinds of athletes. You're not looking at one up here on the stage, unfortunately. Um, he's a 1961 graduate of this institution, and upon graduation, served two years in the United States Air Force. Dr. Horowitz has been in continuous full-time practice here in the Houston area since his separation from the military. He's a member of the ADA, the TDA, Greater Houston Dental Society, the Academy of General Dentistry, American Association of Endodontists, and the Federation of Prosthodontic Organizations. Oh, I've only touched the surface yet, okay? He holds fellowship status in the American College of Dentists, the International College of Dentists, and the Academy of General Dentistry. Dr. Horowitz has served in numerous leadership positions in the profession at the national, state, and local level. He's a recipient of the Master Practitioner Award from the UTSD Alumni Association and was honored in 2010 by that group as the Alumnus of the Year. Also in 2010, if you will, putting his money where his heart is, Dr. Horowitz established an endowed fund in ethics and prof professionalism here at the dental school. Most admirably, he's been, as I mentioned, the speaker for our keynote, or keynote speaker here for our ceremonies since we uh, installed the white coat ceremony. So if you will, join me in giving a heartfelt and generous applause to one Dr. Kenneth Horowitz. You want the mic to walk around? Yeah, for it. just a second. You got it. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. I will make sure that you're set to go. Thank you, Dr. Spear. Uh, I usually thank the dean. I don't think it's on. Hang on. Let oh, me see. Wait that. a minute. There we go. Now, I usually thank the dean. But the dean is not here right now, and he, he does this quite often. He doesn't check with me before he makes another appointment, and um, I'm going to have to talk to him about that. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to be here. I've been doing this a long time, um, longer than I like to remember. Uh, don't listen to the introduction too closely that Dr. Spear gave. He was always a fan of mine, and he talks to my mother all the time, and she tells him what to say. Um, I like looking at young faces. Um, I like talking to young people. I want you to know about dentistry and what it is and what it can do for you and what then that allows you to do for your patients. Uh, every year... When we get close to this day, I pull out the speech and try to tweak it a little bit. Some of you have heard it a long time, and I'm amazed that you want to come back and listen to the same thing over and over again. But it's such an important message, in my opinion, that I like to stick to the script and in a minute, I'll go behind the lectern and I'll start doing what is the worst possible way to teach people, and that is to lecture. But I hope that you will remember that you heard something about ethics and professionalism, even if you don't remember everything that is said. The other thing I want you to realize is that we're trying this format this year this is really kind of new to us. We've never done it. You're going to find out when you have a lecture after lunch, you're going to fall asleep. So I urge you not to do that now. If you can manage to stay awake, I think you'll all benefit 
from what we're going to say. You are the class of 2026. It's both a privilege and an honor to be able to welcome you as you start your journey on the quest for dental knowledge. You have embarked on a trip that can be both exhilarating and frustrating, meaningful and dreadful, fulfilling and humbling. You are to be congratulated on having chosen and been chosen to be a part of one of the finest professions in the world. You're about to start the four-year curriculum of hell known as dental school. I am sure as you progress, you will experience some trepidations, some fear that makes you dream about law school or medical school or even business school. Don't fret, don't give it a second thought. I know you have made the right decision. But what is even more important, you will know you have made the right decision very soon. The further along you progress in your studies, the more relaxed you will become and the more you will learn. And when you sit at commencement in four very, very short years, you will remember this quote from Henry Willard Austin. He was a 19th century author and philosopher. And he said, quote, genius, that power that dazzles mortal eyes is often perseverance in disguise, unquote. By the way, show of hands, does anyone know the difference between genius and stupidity? Genius has limitations. Think about that. My task today is to speak to you concerning professional ethics, and I choose to make this a more palatable subject by dividing it into its components and speaking first on ethics and second on professionalism. Why do we talk about ethics? Because dentistry holds a special position of trust in society. It's a contract, if you will, and a result of that trust, the profession makes a commitment that its members will adhere to the highest of all ethical standards. It is impossible to talk about ethics unless the purpose and the role of property and wealth are made very clear. A society where property and wealth are unimportant or considered evil will have no problem with ethics at all. At the other extreme, a society where people believe that wealth is the sole purpose of human existence will find it very, very difficult to maintain any kind of economic morality. Their obsession with wealth will be so great that it will ride roughshod over any ethical system. John Maynard Keynes once said, the love of money as a possession, as distinguished from the love of money as a means to the enjoyments and realities of life, will be recognized for what it is, a somewhat disgusting morbidity, one of those semi-criminal, semi-pathological propensities which one hands up over with a shudder to the specialist in mental disease. Dentistry has never viewed poverty as a virtue. Substance has always been seen as a challenge. Dentistry places many social and charitable responsibilities on the financially stronger and emphasizes the need to prevent exploitations of the weak, as do many elements of our society. Moral professional behavior encourages long-lasting and successful relationships and loyal patience. Ethics is aptly defined as the science of the moral or the obedience to the unenforceable. Ethics is the inherent personal honesty in daily living. The measure of its quality should not fluctuate, but should be steadfast and lasting. In fact, it should be measurable so as to assure you that is right and wrong about it. The question is, 
can one be a little unethical? Or perhaps the question is, can one be a little ethical? And the answer is no. It is my opinion that ethics is like pregnancy. You either are or you are not. The rub, however, is by whose standards are you to be judged? And I'll approach this question from a philosophical point of view and then leave it to you to extrapolate your own answers. Much of what I say has been gleaned from others. Some is my own prejudice and all is subject to change for our lives represent constant change. My concept of ethics centers around values. How do we value our self-esteem? Should we have thrown out the simplistic morality of our elders, your grandparents? Remember our ethics definition, this science of the moral. Our elders thought that life was so uncomplicated that we could always think in terms of right and wrong, honest and dishonest, moral and immoral. As Mark Twain said, quote, do the right thing. It will gratify some people and it will astonish the rest. But traditions went by the way and we were left with a gray area where if we manipulated the facts long enough and hard enough, we could justify anything. I realize now how much philosophy and morality were taught at home and at school when we were naive. Disagreements were settled without lawyers. Now we must be concerned with the possibility of lawsuits around every corner. Even challenging our opinion on the treatment of our patients. Was the naivety of our parents better? That is a question you will have to answer for yourselves later on in your life. Since in my concept, ethics centers around values, then ethics must include a value system. We need it as a society, we need it as individuals, and we need it as a profession. My value system has four cornerstones. If we lose it, we will lose the first of the four cornerstones of ethics, and that is trust. So far, we have not lost it, certainly not to the extent that some of the professions have. However, I would put it to you that trust may have been temporarily mislaid in everyday life. Our doors and windows are locked. Some patients in our practice, as well as non-patient entities, are questioning our diagnoses, our treatment, our fees, and whether persons who are not doctors should actually be treating you. So trusting each other and know that only good can come from that trust. We must accept the age of consumerism, not as an absolute entity, but as a way to foster education to the public we serve. This must be done in such a way that they will realize and accept our limitations and our uncertainties, while at the same time, they will glory in our abilities to work minor miracles immediately with the major ones taking a few hours. You must stay on the right track while in school and embed this trustworthiness in yourself so deeply that it can never be removed. The second cornerstone is truth. I say be wary when telling the truth becomes secondary rather than an integral part and purpose of dental information. Truth is a dynamic entity. It is never absolute and it is inseparable from honesty. In your dealing with your fellow students, your faculty, your families, and your friends, and later on with your patients and colleagues, never ever falter from the truth. And honesty, regardless of the temptations, add a new fact, truth does not change, but our perception of truth may. So gather information, acquire knowledge, for knowledge is power. In his Ethics of Belief, W.K. Clifford tells us that, quote, we have no right to determine values on incomplete information, unquote. 
This leads us to our third cornerstone, and that is intelligent thought. This is the first step to greatness. It precedes and it supersedes talent. Many people have talent, but never become great. Many are called, but few are able to serve. We all have thought processes, but what is intelligent thought and how does it affect us ethically? To make you think, ponder your next decisions over the next few weeks. You're first in dental school. Will intelligent thoughtfulness contribute to your decision making? Believe me, as difficult as it is now, the process will be more difficult in the coming years. Our fourth cornerstone is honor, a good name or public esteem, a person of superior standing, one whose worth brings respect. Remember, there is no honor among thieves. I remember when this school had the honor system. No, no proctors during exams. Why did we stop? Maybe because honor has to do with self and colleagues. One has to honor oneself and one's profession above all. The honor system requires that if someone breaks the system, they have to tell you. Or if they know that someone has broken the system, they also have to tell. Unfortunately, we have developed a different way of thinking. The statement, never rat on a dishonest colleague, translates to never rat on a rat. If I allow my colleague to be dishonest, then I am dishonored and my profession is dishonored. This is heavy stuff, this honor, this idea of professional ethics. It has to come from your value system. Ethical principles may change over time, but the changes should evolve gradually and not appear whimsical. We as people of the healing arts have lived with this science of the moral from Maimonides and Hammurabi to the dentist pledge, which you will recite later on this morning. From the ancient Hebrew writings, the ethics of our fathers, to the new codes of professional conduct and ethics of the American Dental Association. Compliance with these principles of ethics passed down through the years is a moral obligation of all dentists. We in the Alumni Association are here to help you in your quest for these ethical values. We honor you. We are intelligently thinking about you. And we trust you. And that is the truth. But what about professionalism? It is defined as professional character, spirit, or methods. And I would submit to you that there is a difference between a trade and a profession. And I believe it is professionalism. We look upon each other as colleagues, not as competitors. We are servants, not merchants. We provide services, not commodities. And our allegiance is to mankind, not to material wealth. It seems to some of us that we have come full circle from the dentistry of the early 20th century. Then crass commercialism permeated much of dentistry. Most dental education was proprietary. Advertising was rampant. And many practitioners were involved in dental commercial ventures. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Look at the newspaper or listen to television. Dr. L.D. Pankey prof defined professionalism is, as that quality of conduct which accompanies the use of superior knowledge, care, skill, and judgment toward the benefits of another person or a society prior to the consideration of self-interest. So what will I say to you that will make you think about your future acts of professionalism? 
I will say that professionalism is measured by relationships. And there are four relationships that you must consider. Number one, and most important, the doctor-patient relationship. Be cognizant that the duty of a dentist to the patient is more than just an obligation incurred by a contractual agreement. Your relationship must adhere to the highest possible principles of education, skill, judgment, and concern. You must not compromise your principles for ego or wealth. And you must be realistically idealistic in the treatment of your fellow man. Number two, the doctor-doctor relationship. And you can start that relationship now, for you are surrounded by your colleagues, not your competitors. Help each other and help yourselves. Be generous with your knowledge and do not fail to come to a colleague's aid. Always remember to give each other the benefit of the doubt and do not be quick to criticize. Number three, the doctor-patient relationship, the doctor-profession relationship. Contribute your time and effort to your profession and always, always speak highly of it. To denigrate your profession is to denigrate yourself. Present your profession at its best and you elevate yourself to new heights. And number four, the doctor-community relationship. Professionals put back into the community in which they live that which is commensurate with their position. It's done by charity work, community service, and involvement beyond the average commitment. If professionalism is the descriptive action of learned professionals, then what constitutes a learned professional? Number one, education beyond the usual level. The dentist not committed to lifelong learning and change in practice strategies has difficulty practicing ethically. And number two, the right of autonomy. It translates to self-improvement and self-regulation and the right to share that with others. And finally, number three, service to humanity. We have a duty to recognize the reciprocity of the relationship that exists with society and the, and the duty of covenantal fidelity, which means your commitment. It is a huge task being a member of a profession and adhering to its professional ethics. This science of the moral, this obedience to the unenforceable. There are many detractors that will be pulling at all of you. First, as you go through dental school, and then as you progress through your practice life. Hold on to your ideals. Look forward and set your standards high. Do not listen to the doom and gloom people. The world has always been in turmoil. The state of the economy, political controversy, international intrigue, they're all the same chapters of history which have been rewritten many times with very little change except the cast of characters. So dwell not upon all that is fear. Look to your own values and there will be no problem with ethics. And if all else fails, look to the golden rule for it says it all. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But listen carefully. If we reinforce the notion that the golden rule has been changed to read those that make the gold make the rule or that doctors should weed our patients who are difficult or challenging and that the business of dentistry is business, we shall reap what we sow. When dentists become merchants, patients become customers and truth becomes the loser. Our challenge is to get inside our brains. Know that our actions are a direct reflection on our parents and our loved ones. They suffer if we are untruthful, untrustworthy, or unethical. Whether we are legal or not is no excuse to them. The imperative of integrity demands honesty even when it is contrary to business 
or professional advantage. And when you are struggling to get your requirements or make career decisions and you need the courage of your convictions, remember this quote from Teddy Roosevelt. It's a very favorite one of mine. Quote, it is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man has stumbled and fallen, or where the doer of good deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, and at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievements, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat." Unquote. As there is in every worthwhile endeavor, there is a price to pay for the privilege of being a part of this profession. So remember this idea if you remember nothing else from this morning. Whatsoever ye want, O discontented man, step up, pay the price, and take it. In conclusion, I want to talk about moral courage. The question I would pose is this. How many of you will have the moral courage to be an ethical professional, to stand up and be counted in the face of an unpopular cause, especially one that calls for self-sacrifice, material loss, and the possible recrimination of your colleagues. Moral courage requires that we face the deeper and more dangerous internal threat of exposing our ethical positions to examination and scrutiny. This question you will ponder over the next four years at least, and maybe even longer. The future of our profession is in your hands. Treat it thoughtfully and not without fear of making the wrong decisions. Trust your instincts and let truth be your guiding light. Having said all this, I would like to interject this caveat. Ethics, this science of the moral, this obedience to the unenforceable, does not mean perfection. Given the imperfection of the human race, tolerance to that imperfection must be a part of your ethical makeup. Humans stray from the path of perfection in many ways, many times during their lifetime. So perfection is not the goal of ethics. Knowledge of this science of morality, of morality and tolerance of ourselves and others when we stray is our goal. We must pursue this goal intelligently, enthusiastically, and with fortitude, never losing the purpose of ethical thinking in the mire of imperfection and intolerance. In closing, my career can be summed up in the paraphrase of a George Bernard Shaw quote that goes like this. Dentistry is no brief candle for me. It is a sort, a sort of splendid torch that I have gotten hold of for a moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Thank you for your time, and good luck in our profession. You're welcome. So I'm going to challenge you. You know, you sit through things like this and you take in a lot. I'm a firm believer in reflection. I try and reflect at the end of the day and try and decide what went well, what maybe didn't go well, what I could have done differently. What did I learn for the day? So at the end of today, Maybe the end of multiple days. Take a moment to reflect upon what you heard. How will you take this incorporate it into your daily life? What type of dentist are you going to become? 
So I didn't say just what type of student. What type of dentist are you going to become? Will you take these things that you've heard today and make them a part of who you are, what you are? These are important questions for you to think about and, and consider. It's overwhelming right now. You come in and you've got these four years ahead of you, but it's that pathway in mind of what will you become? How will you take this information, take all these things that you're going to learn and make them a part of who you are? You're going to grow every day, I hope. Some of you sat here today and you probably didn't, won't take anything out of today. We can't change that. But I know a number of you will. You heard the words. Now it's taking them and using them and making them a part of who you are and the fabric of your basically well-being. I'll stop there. It's my pleasure to introduce no stranger to you at this time, our Dean, Dr. John Valenza. Thank you, Dr. Spears. And that echoes what we talked about yesterday about what's going to be your personal brand. And by the way, those of you in scrubs, you look really great, man. I tell you, you're, you're getting there. You're getting there. Um, before we do the dentist pledge, a couple things I'd like to do. Um, one is uh, there, there are a couple of special guests here today that I want to recognize. I know Dr. Spears mentioned we have some visitors, but uh, uh, two in particular, three in particular. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Steve Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz, if you would stand. Dr. Schwartz. I know he looks just like a kid. He uh, is a 68 graduate of the DDS program and a 70 graduate of our endodontics program and a long, long time friend of, uh, of our school and dentistry, organized dentistry. Uh, I could go on and on about his accomplishments in the state of Texas and beyond. So, Steve, so gl glad you're here today. Also from San Antonio, I have Dr. Gary Kale and his wife, Virginia. If y'all would please stand. Uh, part of the famous 1973 class. Is that right? That's what Dr. Bogan tells me all the time. Him and Dr. Hoopengarner and uh, numerous others are in that class. So delighted that y'all made the trip today and so good to see you. So um, it's great having you. So I know also Dr. Um, Spears talked about the transition to today from um, our white coat. And um, one thing that uh, we talked about when we said, okay, uh, we're going to transition the white coat from the orientation to the middle of the second year was let's be sure, though, that we do the dentist pledge now. Um, uh, some have said, well, let's wait till you're more formally into direct patient care, but your, your time as a professional starts this week. And uh, uh, rumor has it Dr. Cooley prepped you on the dentist pledge. Is that true? Okay, so uh, we won't stumble at all. So how about all the first year students rise and uh, any dentists in the audience, if you'd please rise. Uh, everybody should have a copy of the dentist pledge in front of you. And we will read this together, okay? Ready? I, as a member of the dental profession, shall keep this pledge and these stipulations. I understand and accept that primary responsibility is to my patients, and I shall dedicate myself to render, to the best of my ability, the highest standard of oral health care and to maintain a relationship of respect and confidence. Therefore, let all come to me safe in the knowledge that their total health and well being are my first considerations. I shall accept the responsibility that, as a professional, my competence rests on continuing the attainment of knowledge and skill in the arts and sciences of dentistry. I acknowledge my obligation to support and sustain the honor and integrity of the profession and to conduct myself in all endeavors such that I shall merit the respect of patients, colleagues, and my community. I further commit myself to the betterment of my community for the benefit of all society. I shall faithfully observe the principles of ethics and code of professional conduct set forth by the profession. 
All this I pledge with pride in my commitment to the profession and the public it serves. Thank you, and uh, I hope I did good enough to match you all from what Dr. Cooley taught you. So thank you all. I'll turn it back to Dr. Spears if y'all want to have a seat. I think that's one of those things that big round of applause, big hoop and holler or something. I mean, come on. Congratulations. One more step in the process of becoming that DDS. I get, I get to really ask you, hey, did you make progress towards your, your dental degree today? And, oh, yeah, I did. I did. So fantastic. So I'm not going to keep you here longer, but what I encourage you to do, so we have on the schedule from one to two our student organizations. And as Dean Valenza mentioned to you the other day, one of the things we were really excited about this year was getting back to having uh, in person, a lot of it because of our student organizations and getting back involved with them. So when you get back up to the fourth floor, you will see tables set out uh, kind of down that main hallway uh, where the classrooms are and different student organizations are set up there to tell you about their organization. They probably got some stuff they'll sell you if you so choose to do so or whatever, but definitely take the time, get to meet them, get to hear about their organizations to find out about um, what they do. However, before you leave this room, I'm going to encourage you, um, we're going to be COVID friendly and maybe not go shake a lot of hands or whatever, but go around the room today and introduce yourself to our guests, to our alums, to our faculty that are here at the room. Start that process of getting to know people in organized dentistry and the people who contribute so much to what we do here at the school. So before you leave, take a moment, say hello. Introduce yourself, get to know them. It's part of who we are. We talk UTSD family, this is part of our family. So thank you. It's been a great first event. So I will see you upstairs shortly. <laughs>